grateful that you've come on the show today to tell us about this process because we must tell these stories. We Good morning, America, Australia, New Zealand, and also a huge good morning to Vince. Vince, hey. <laughs> how are you going? I am good. I'm so happy to be on here. That was such an inspirational intro. I was like, oh man, I was choking up. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> uh, to all our listeners, look, I must apologize. I'm over in Queensland, Australia. There are some massive storms and our beautiful host, Tony Lontis, is stuck in the middle of them and she has no internet. So it is just myself and Vince Warnock this morning, but I'm sure that we'll get enough information from Vince to make you uh, want to contact him. Vince, my name is Kez Wickham St. George. I'm your host for this morning. And I can. we've already had a wee chat and I'm already just so impressed. I can't wait to get into the story with you. So tell me, how did it all originate with you? Where did, where did Vince originate from? Oh, wow. Well, once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away. Now, um, so look, I, okay, background on me. I'll go through the very whirlwind tour on this. Um, okay. I actually grew up in here in New Zealand, but I grew up in okay. a very um, poverty stricken area and I grew up in a really abusive household, um, but managed to break free of all of that. And um, that was due to having a really amazing teacher around me that showed me that I can aspire to be something amazing. I can aspire to actually help people. I can aspire to do something with my life. Um, that was at age 11. I'll never forget. He was an incredible teacher, um, but he really did inspire me a lot. And so from there, I've always had this entrepreneurial kind of bent. In fact, when I was 11 was when I launched my first company. Um, I Please don't hold me to account to this. Note that I came <laughs> from a background where um, I had no moral compass. Like my parents were abusive. So I had yes. nothing to really kind of guide me at all. So my first company was literally selling pirated video games. I, I worked out, I had a Commodore 64 and I'm like, wow, all the games and software for this are on cassette tape. Ta-da! So I used to sell these and make a lot of money from that. So I've always had that kind of inclination towards entrepreneurship. Now, every company I've had since then, I'll just clarify, have been above board, and I've I now have a very strong moral compass. Just stating, um, but for me, through, yeah, but for me, through most of my career, I've kind of been in and out of both camps. So I've been in and out of entrepreneurship, in and out of corporate life. So. In the early days, I would create and fail a company and then go back to corporate with my tail between my legs going, oh, and then build up enough money, start another company until finally I started creating companies and then selling them and actually moving on uh -huh. from them, having success. And I had just come off the back of my largest acquisition, actually. It was a um, company called Common Ledger, which we built over three and a half years of extreme stress and extreme anxiety. Um, uh -huh. But we actually exited that for multi-eight figures. And then for me, that was like, okay, now I need a new chapter of my life. Um, I wouldn't admit this to the team, but I went to go and work at Signa Insurance for a holiday because I thought this is going to be a lot less stressful than having <laughs> my company. Um, but I, was, I took the chief marketing officer role there and was at Signa for five years. And right. on, at that five years on paper was the dream job. Like seriously, okay. this is what most marketers aspire to. Um, I had the super large corporate uh, you know, corner office, um, one of the top floors here. Uh, in fact, I had the biggest office, but I wasn't allowed to say that because the CEO was like, no, ah, but you've just said biggest. It. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I had the Mad Men style whiskey cabinet. It was awesome. I got oh, to work on some gosh. incredible projects. Um, the pay was ludicrous. Um, but then also I started getting the results and started getting the recognition mm -hmm. for those results as well. I managed to. That's what happens, isn't it? You get results, yeah. you get recognition. Oh, yes. I've always been a firm believer. I do the opposite of what most guys do. So. Guys, and the difference between men and women going into a corporate environment often, not always, but often is men will always kind of go, you know what, I don't think I can do the job, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to demand lots of money for this. Whereas women go in and go, I want to prove myself. I've always been on the prove myself side of things where I go in and go, okay. you know what, I don't care what you pay me. I'm going to show you what I'm worth anyway. And then you're going to end up paying me what I want. So it's just. Oh, I like that. I yeah, like that. And it, and it works. Yeah. It really did. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, like I said, I took the online sales from next to nothing. Like it really, everyone mm. said to me, you can't do online sales for insurance, but especially medical and life insurance. Nobody does that. It's too hard. And I'm like, I'm a marketer. Hold my beer. <laughs> I've got this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I took that from nothing to almost 50% of their revenue. So basically double Fabulous. the revenue. 
there. Yeah, double the revenue of a Fortune 100. Well, now this is on air, Vince. You'll have people knocking on your door saying, please come and work for me. Oh, no, no. (laughs) I am long done in corporate, by the way. (laughs) For those of you that want to come and knock, listen to the rest of the story because... yeah. Getting for, that recognition. For sure. Yeah, so getting that we talk, recognition. We're going to talk results. about um, your book. And your yep. book is called Chasing Insights. Chasing now, I found insights. that That's really, it. really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, what does it encourage the reader to do as in take action, um, education? What does it encourage your readers to do? Yeah. Well, the okay, I said about with the book. So Chasing the Insights was really about bringing in a, a framework for experimentation. So for marketers. So for anyone that's into mm-hmm. marketing or entrepreneurship, it really was giving you a framework to be able to bring experimentation in. Um, so that was how I set out. So that was what I really wanted to give people from that. But what I discovered within there is there was two other kind of elements that really were important. One of them was shifting a mentality. And I really did want to shift this. And, and a lot of, if you're an entrepreneur, you know this, everyone tells you that there's some silver bullet that's going to make you succeed, like create an online course that's evergreen. Next thing you know, you're going to be rolling in the money or launch an NFT series and you're going to be millionaire and overnight and all these kind of things, or, mm. you know, create an online community, a Facebook group, and it will just profit you and profit you and profit you. But the reality is none of that's true. And all of that's true because what we do is we chase the silver bullet syndrome. We go, okay, that's the one thing that's going to get me success. Yes. And what I wanted to do was change people's narrative around that and change their understanding to realize that actually it's not about chasing the one thing. It's about progress. It's about a progressive increase. So for all of us, we actually, the more we try new things, the more we experiment with new things, the more we look at why things are working and why they aren't, we're going to see these incremental gains. And that's what, that was really what I set about to do. And then the other thing was actually changing the mindset because a lot of people fear failure. And I saw this with, um, actually, Kiz, you'll appreciate this. I saw this with one of my first companies or one of my early companies. Uh, it was, we created over a thing called a startup weekend, which is where uh-huh. for, it's technically 72 hours, not 48 or something. So it's not really a weekend, but over this period of time, you build a business, right? You gather people together. Yes, you build a business, yes. Compete with I understand. Others. Yeah. And, um, and I came up with this concept that was just going to take over the world. It was awesome. It's called mobile combat. <laughs> it was a yeah. mobile game that put iPhone users versus the very new at the time, Android users mm-hmm. and the uh, probably three people in the world that use Windows Mobile, you know? So it was all these Uh mobile phones. It was this game where you would battle each other and things. And I thought, this is going to be amazing. So I did my testing on that, did my user testing in focus groups and all that. And it was going to be huge. It was going to be the next big thing. Um, It failed miserably. And it failed for two reasons. One, I, I had the wrong developer. I really did. And the second thing was I spent all my time uh, research and consumer behavior and will they buy this and will they buy into it rather so they'll buy the micro transactions within there but forgot to actually research research the landscape and missed mm-hmm. a glaringly obvious thing which is that apple do not like to be compared to anyone so when we brought some sponsors on board including a couple of really large telcos and that was going to be honestly the turning point for the whole project mm-hmm. um bringing these telcos on board and um, they the apple turned around and said wait a minute you're doing what uh that's not happening and in fact, if you side with this project, you give any kind of money to this project, you support this project in any way, we won't allow you to sell iPhones in your stores. So that basically hobbled the business overnight. Now, the problem right. with that is that's a huge learning thing for me. Like if you think about it, that taught me a valuable lesson about not just, not just scanning the landscape for the consumer behavior, but also the, the business behavior, looking at what mm. the other stakeholders in this are doing. Yes, so I, yes. I learned a lot from that process. Now, fast so, forward. Can I just interrupt yeah. you there? Because I know that the listeners will be looking at the the um, the silver bullet section <laughs> that yeah. you just talked about. Um, and I have found that in my box, when, you know, I'm a writer too. So yeah. if I came up with a silver bullet and thought this is going to interest my readers. So yeah. you're also talking about changing their mindset, which I'm, I'm very much into. Yeah. Um, and they read your books and they would they find the silver bullet in your books or is it changing the mindset if you see the silver bullet? It's changing the mindset. And, th- and this is the key thing for me is, like my book's actually structured, my first book that is, is structured in three sections. So the first section is the framework. This is what experimentation is, gives you the background on it how to implement that into your organization or to your business. But the second part of the book is really about the mindset required to do so. And this was the biggest challenge I thought was this fear of failure that people had, 
would exactly. stop them from actually doing these experiments. Yeah. So I have a whole section in there where I teach them how to build resilience, how to build fortitude, yeah. how to cultivate curiosity, how to actually remove cognitive bias from your understanding of, of data and of, of insights and things that you were getting as well. So it really was focused largely around those kind of mindset shifts that we wanted. So there's, you've just mentioned the word fear and as an author yep. myself um, and yeah, and coming from, a sort of abusive background myself. Yep. My father was an alcoholic. Mm. So, you know, you drag yourself out of that situation, don't you? And then, but you've got all these, this, uh, this mindset that's actually built into you. And I found that I was surrounded by fear of yep. what people would think about me. Um, and that was my main, main stalling is yeah. what are people, you know, I'm a little kid from Lower Hutt Nainai, um, <laughs> What on earth are they going Bizarre, to by the way, I actually spent a large amount of my childhood, my little childhood in Nainai. That was where I grew up as well. We were Is probably neighbours. Yeah. Oh, I said to my husband last night when I was reading your bio, I know that man. I know him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I went to uh, Eastern Hutt Primary School, by the way. Eastern Hutt Primary School when I was five. Ah. Yeah. No, only I went for to about half a year. I went oh. to Eastern Primary School and Nainai College. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Wow, yeah. small, small world. <laughs> it certainly is. We came from the same neighbourhood. How's that? Yeah. So back to you, Vince. Um, so we're talking about fear yeah. and your books on mindset, if it's read correctly. And this is a big thing I find because I read a yeah. lot of improvement books. It's reading it correctly and then applying it. Would you agree? Yeah, 100%. And it, it's that we have this weird myth about fear. Um, mm. And I remember, I remember having to deal with this in my own life. So I suffer from imposter syndrome like anybody else. In fact, I remember Everyone publishing. Yeah, yeah, and I remember publishing my first book. Um, I spiraled so quick. Like I knew this book was going to be a hit. I knew it was going to go down really well because I knew mm. the content I was putting in there worked. I mean, I'd used it in every startup and every all, uh, corporate all environment that I'd been to and I'd seen the successes from it. So no brainer. But um, um, as soon as, in fact, as soon as I went to publish the book, someone said to me, you can't do a book launch, Vince. Nobody does book launches anymore. You know, no one goes to them. And I went, I'm a marketer. Come on. So yeah. organized this launch. We had 100 or so people there. It was, it was a really nice event. Surrounded by people that I love, surrounded by people that I respect. Had my peers. Beautiful. Actually, a few people fly from Australia to come over for it as well. Beautiful. And it was, it was a wonderful night. It really was. Mm. I'm a high extrovert. You put me in front of a crowd. I'm super happy. So I got to tell them my story, tell them how I wrote the book. <laughs> Uh, and I knew that everyone was going to ask for a signed copy, which was weird for me because this concept of giving your autograph, essentially, I'm like, I'm not a, I'm not a celebrity. I'm barely an average karaoke singer. Why would they want my autograph, you know? But then I realized if I'm going to a book launch, that's exactly what I want. So yes. I was all prepped and ready. I bought myself a fancy new pen. I'm like, this is going to be awesome. Turned up there, signed all these books. The one thing I didn't count on, though, Kiz, was the fact that every single person said something along the lines of, oh, thanks, Vince, I can't wait to read this. And uh -huh. every single time they said that, my stomach would not. And Why I that? left that event, well, I left that event that night thinking I should be on top of the world because I'm getting all this input from all these people and I'm high uh -huh. extrovert, so I should be energized. But I had all these conversations flying in my head going, who do you think you are, Vince? Like, what makes uh -huh. you think you have the right to write a book? What makes you think that anyone wants to hear what you have to say? Or uh -huh. if they read this book, you know what they're going to think amateur hour you know like so the imposter syndrome hit you hard oh it it didn't just tap me on the shoulder and whisper in my ear this thing was screaming at me so <laughs> oh, so dear. i did something terrible that night i decided i didn't want to talk about my book anymore oh. i decided that's it i'm not going to talk about it so next day i rang um so i had forbes cio magazine and digenomica all lined up to do interviews with me for about the book and everything they were doing a big spread on me I had to contact all of them and say, look, I'm really sorry. I'm just super busy. I don't have time to do this, which was wow. rubbish. That was me just being afraid. Yeah, and, but imagine the, the impact that would have had on, on yeah. you coming out as an author. Well, it, yeah, it, it kind of did. Actually, I, I surprisingly got a lot of really good organic growth. Like, honestly, the book sales went through the roof, which was awesome. But for two weeks, I was dead quiet. I wouldn't talk about it at all. No social post yeah. about it, no press, nothing. And it was actually one of my mentors who called me up and He's based in the US. He's like eight times best-selling author or something. Like just a phenomenal guy. And and normally, by the way, he never rings you. You have to book time with him. So it's, okay. you know, it's very official. But he just rang yeah. me out of the blue. And 
and old fashioned rang me like on the phone. And he just checked in with me and said, Oh, how's it going? I said, Oh, good, good, good. And he said, Yep. So how's the book sales going? So I told him the numbers and he was like, Oh, actually, that's really good. And I said, Yeah. And he goes, But I haven't seen anything out there from you. I haven't seen any press. I haven't seen any social posts. And I said, Yeah, I'm just really busy at the moment. You know, which I was really busy, but I said, yes. I'm really busy at the moment. So I'm relying on word of mouth. And he goes, Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm going to call you on that, Vince. And I went, what? And he goes, I'm going to call BS on that right now. He said, and I'm going to tell you a process that I go through every time uh-huh. I publish a book. And this is a traditionally published, you know, best, yes. like I said, New York Times bestselling author. Yeah. And he said, every single time one of my books goes out there to publish. And then he told me the exact process I just went through. And he oh, told wow. me every single time I don't feel worthy. I think people are going to see through me. And it, it did two things to me, kids. It actually helped me to, first of all, it actually like took away a lot of the fear that I had or, or took away yes. the effect of that fear. Yeah, what off? Mm. Yeah, and the, the second thing is it made me realize the importance of actually talking about this kind of stuff. So so I did something unthinkable. The next day I wrote a post to put it out on LinkedIn. I just said, look, this is the process I've just been bo- uh, just been through. And I wrote this big post up about imposter syndrome, what I was dealing with. And then at the end I said, so here, I'm going to take action on that now. And I'm going to tell you this. It's a damn good book. It is because I've I've put my heart, soul, you know, blood, sweat, and tears into this thing. Mm. I know this stuff works because I'm living it, you know? Yes. So if you're a marketer or entrepreneur, go and buy the book. You're not going to regret it. And oh, I want to buy the book. Just look, just <laughs> listening to you. I want to go buy the book. <laughs> well, I, two things happened from there, though. One was um, a massive spike in sales, which obviously is really nice when you're an author. It was like, hey, yeah. this is awesome. The second thing that happened, though, Kez, was my inbox got flooded by people going, same or me too, or I feel like you were speaking my life. Oh, and that's wow. when I realized that we all deal with this all the time. And yes. there's a weird myth that we have to get rid of that fear. But this isn't the case. And this is the journey I went on is to go, okay, if we're all feeling this, if we're all feeling this imposter syndrome, and you know, with that, I because I have ADHD, with that comes a thing called RSD, which is rejection sensitivity dysphoria. Uh-huh. So I'm always fearful of rejection and things. So dealing with all this kind of stuff, I'm like, I need to understand how the brain works. And that's Ah, when I came across something really different, which is understanding what imposter syndrome is. And Now, that's interesting because people don't do that. They just think I've got it. And how do they deal with it? They don't understand it. I don't. I grew up being a victim. Like as a child, I was continually powerless, continually at the mercy of other people's, you know, drugs or alcohol or whatever mood they're in at the time, or if they decided to set my hair on fire or Uh shoot me or whatever else, you know, like these were the things we just had to live with as kids. So I was determined not to be that. I need to control my own future. So that's why I study everything. But I discovered something, kids. I discovered that um, imposter syndrome itself isn't actually a bad thing. And fear itself isn't actually a bad thing. These are actually things that are designed to protect us. It's what we choose to do with those things Exactly. That was really damaging, you know? Exactly, so yeah. I started to understand that all the process I had been through, that fear that I was feeling, that imposter syndrome that was kicking in, was actually my brain's way of going, hey, Vince, guess what? You're outside of your comfort zone right now, which mm-hmm. makes you vulnerable, right? You've stepped Fabulous. voluntarily out of that, and now yes. you could be exposed. So my brain's role was to try and get me back into safety, to get me yes. back into that little, little of right. an area and kind of yeah. keep me warm and safe and secure, so it does mm. that using fear. So it goes, hey, you're going to be exposed. But once I understood what the brain was doing, it was really easy for me to then go, okay, well, hang on a minute. If my brain is sending me a signal to tell me you're outside of your comfort zone, mm. the other mm. truth that I know is as entrepreneurs, as authors, as, as anybody who's creative, outside of the comfort zone is exactly where you need to be. That's where growth happens. That's where breakthrough happens. That's where prosperity happens. So stepping out of the comfort zone was exact. So my brain was basically just saying, hey, Vince, guess what? You're exactly where you need to be right now. So, so I had to yes. retrain my yeah. brain to understand that and then to mm. embrace imposter syndrome and to Keep embrace coming. fear, you know? So, yes. yeah. It's, cool. it's, uh, for, me, for me, it was embracing those two things. Um, coming from my background, it was yeah. like my whole body said, I don't want to do this. I actually got sick. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't want to do this. I don't common. want to do this. And then my brain stepped in and said, "But how are you going to get the word across?" Uh, because I like to, I like to write about emotional issues. So, yeah. uh, but it comes in fiction story form. But yeah. it's, um, yeah, it was training my mind. You're so right, Vince. It yeah. really was getting like, like it was like getting it and ringing it in two and saying, "I don't want to be that yeah. person, but yeah. I know it's there." 
So uh, I'd like to ask you another question is that um, do all your books encourage empowerment and for all entrepreneurs to be seen and heard? 1000%. Yes, I, I'm. I, I think it's, it's natural for me anyway, because that's who I am. I mean, I left yes. my dream job. I left that job at Cigna, you know, which, as I said, on paper was was perfect, you know. Got all the recognition there, got won a slew of awards, even got recognized by Adobe as one of the top 50 marketers in the world. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, but I sat there in the office going, I don't want this job. I'm really unhappy. I was miserable. Mm. And that's when I, and, and also I felt a huge amount of shame, uh, shilting, uh, sh shame and guilt about that as well. I was really embarrassed oh, really? by the fact that shame well, and most, guilt. most people wanted that job. And here I was going, I felt ungrateful. I felt like I don't want this. But I had to realize why that was. And it was because mm. I was unfulfilled. And that's when I realized that the reason I'm unfulfilled is I'm not where I am designed to be, which is in front of people, helping people. Mm. I, I genuinely have a heart. I love entrepreneurship. Like I said, I started when yes. I was 11. It is mm. something I'm really, really passionate about. Mm. And helping entrepreneurs is just built into my DNA as a result of that. So, so for me, that empowerment piece is really important. I don't like... Uh, I, I don't like going in and saying to someone, I'm going to tell you how to do something. I would rather help them to come to the conclusion themselves. Like rather than go, I'm going to do, you know, social media strategy, for example. I don't want to go in and do the social media strategy for you. I want to help you to come up with it. So therefore, when you see it, it's not something that causes tension. It's something that you can own and you're proud of. Same with when helping any of my clients become authors. Um, I'm like, there's a, and we, we've talked about this before, but traditional yes. publishers really yeah. do bother me and sorry to Hay House and all you guys I know you're <laughs> awesome no, no, you're sorry. <laughs> but, but the reality is um you know they they do control the narrative of your book mm, because they do they've yeah. been doing this for so long mm. and they know what sells and what doesn't exactly the thing that they miss is it's your book and yes. this is the thing with any of my clients I want to make sure that if I'm helping them to become published authors and I put them through my own publishing company my developmental editor has a very clear directive this oh. is their book. Anything you give them is merely recommendations. It is their okay. book. We need to empower people to be able to do this themselves rather than be dependent on us. So with that discussion, I'm going yeah. to ask you something that has been asked me many times. How do you know the difference? How do you know that you're, you know, there's many words bandied about. Yeah. How do you know you're an entrepreneur? Is it a feeling? Is it knowledge? Is it... <laughs> Uh, read knowledge uh, for me personally it was knowing that it was a calling more than anything and yeah. I wouldn't call myself so much an entrepreneur as in um, I'm I'm a writer yeah. you know, and I don't like to wear any hat bigger than that I'm a writer and I love to entertain <laughs> so um, how would you say that people recognize their own entrepreneurship because each and every one of us are different Oh, 1,000% different. And I, I'll just challenge you on one thing there too, Kez. You are definitely an entrepreneur. I know you don't like hat, wearing hats bigger than being an author, but you are definitely, if you're a writer, if you're an author, you are an entrepreneur. You have a product that you are selling. You have a story that you're telling. You have something that you've created that makes you an entrepreneur and a good one at that. Um, so for me, the it's not, it's definitely not knowledge. And I'll tell you why, because um, as an entrepreneur, we have no idea what the hell we're doing. No, none of us do. We just make this stuff up as we go along. And actually, that's exactly how it should be. You shouldn't be embarrassed about that. Because mm. if you think about what you're doing, when you're creating a new company or you're writing a new book, mm. you are going into uncharted territories. You that's are creating right. something that does not exist. You're calling it into existence, yeah. which mm. means technically you are making things up as you go along. So yes. that's a good thing. So it's definitely mm -hmm. not the knowledge. Um, and I don't even know if it's, a feeling it kind of is a feeling but it's more I like to say it's the creativity and if yes. you have the desire to create something if you have mm -hmm. and and you know if you've got this it's like a little spark inside you it's a little hook when you that's get it. it inside you then that's yeah. it you guess what you're an entrepreneur whether you accept that's it right. or know it or believe it or not you know so yeah yeah so I, I'm a firm believer in it's the spark it's, yeah. it's yeah. not it's not learned I mean I didn't learn this at college yeah. I didn't learn it at university. I learned it um, through literally my husband going up north to the Pilbara and I was on my own and the spark grew and I thought, I can't just sit here. I just yeah. can't sit here. So well, one, um, of my, one of my clients' kids um, was hilarious. She was like, I don't know if I'm an entrepreneur. I've got this idea. So I helped her to develop the idea and said, look, well, what if you thought about it from this perspective? And she's like, oh, yeah. Then she rang me up one day and she was like, oh, I'm so frustrated. And I said, why? And she goes, my day job. 
I'm hating it right now. Everything is frustrating me. Everything's annoying me. And I said, well, that's, that's obvious. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, you're an entrepreneur now. That hook is inside of you. You're already starting to germinate the seed that's in you. Mm. You're starting to birth this idea. The more you do that, the more a corporate job or a retail job or whatever else is just going to frustrate the heck out of you because you want to create something new. Yes, I agree entirely. It's it's but it's it's creating the new. It's sitting there and knowing that it's your baby. Yeah. You're giving birth to it, and yeah. it's uh, it's exciting. It really is. With yeah. any entrepreneur that that I talk to, they all actually agree with you. It's yeah. not knowledge, it's a feeling. Yeah. So definitely. you were challenged to write your first book? Yep, yep. And how did that make you feel when you had to change your beliefs in yourself? <laughs> Scary. Um, I, actually had, I actually had three motivations to write my first book. So one of them was the fact that I was getting all this success with all the stuff that I'd done. And I had... Like particularly, I work at Cigna. I worked at Cigna Insurance. I had every Cigna market of the world going, hey, Vince, we want to grab an hour of your time every week. And I'm going, well, if there's over 40 markets and they want an hour of my time each week, that's over mm -hmm. a full-time job. What about I write down this in a book form and then I can make some money from it and I'll sell it all to yes. them. And that yes. works really well. But the other two reasons, one was um, a friend of mine that uh, he had published his first book, but he didn't tell me. He, uh -huh. actually, he was based in an um, agency up in Auckland and he was moving uh -huh. to New York. He was going to set up a new agency there and set up a new startup. So he came down and saw me and we had a beer before he went. And he said, look, I'm heading off there. And I said, oh, yeah, but I'm going to miss you. And he goes, yeah, same man. He goes, oh, I forgot to tell you. I'm a published author now. And I went, wait, what? This is awesome. <laughs> I was freaking out. I'm going, dude, why didn't you tell me? We're going to celebrate. And he goes, oh, I wouldn't bother. It's rubbish. I said, oh. you can't say that about your own Oh, my book. God. I know, I know. But the reason he did that, well, the reason he said that was because he did it as a social experiment. He wanted to prove that when you were a published author, it would open doors for you. And I'm like, okay, well, did it work? And he goes, uh, way better than I thought. Like, honestly, the doors had opened from, he was really surprised about. So I thought to myself, you know what? I want a piece of that. I want, I like yeah. that idea. I like the fact mm. that people will take you more seriously. People will take you, yes. give you more credibility, more thought leadership if you're a published author. But then the third reason, though, and this is the one that really did challenge me, is, and this is, I, I'm, I have a cheeky kind of nature as an entrepreneur. I don't like being told I can't do something. It really, really bothers me. So I would um, love to pick I, that up, Vince. <laughs> yeah, yeah, funny that. <laughs> but I, I, I used to work with this angry Canadian woman, and she oh, was. I read that. <laughs> yeah, she had, she had written a couple of books before, and I'm like, oh yeah. And we were, we were in a leadership meeting there at, at one of my previous organizations, not one of my companies, but one of the corporates I worked with. And my job there was to, I, I was the marketing guy. I was the digital marketing guy, particularly. Uh -huh. And one of the things that I kept getting was from universities and tertiary institutions wanted me to travel around and travel around the world and talk to them and uh -huh. teach them digital marketing. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. And we're sitting in a leadership meeting and actually we're standing because she was right next to me. She's really short. And they were talking about the fact that the universities want me to go on the road again and want me to go uh -huh. and do some workshops with them. And she lost it. She was like, why is it always Vince? Vince, Vince, Vince. That's all I ever hear. He's not an author. He wouldn't make an author's a-hole. And I went, A, I'm right next to you. Uh, and B, challenge accepted. So yes. I decided at that point I was going to be an author. Now, yes. through the writing process, because it actually took me a while to write the book, but part of that was because of a tragedy that happened during it. So I would set aside an hour every day, early in the morning. So usually about um, four o'clock in the morning, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I would right set aside an, yeah. Yeah, an hour every morning at four o'clock to write my book. Yes. Now, the problem with that is during that time, um, one of my sisters who I'm very close with uh, was diagnosed with melanoma, uh, with cancer. Okay. And it spread very, very fast and things. So now she, she's tough. Like, honestly, this woman is just, she was incredible. Um, yeah. so for about a year while she was dealing with all this and she had two teenage boys and a husband, but uh -huh. what would happen is they would go to bed and they would go to yes. sleep and then she would wake up and she was putting on the brave face for everyone going, I'm not in pain and I'm not afraid. I'm not scared, but she yeah. knew that I was online. She was based in Australia. So she knew I was online and knew with the time zone difference that would work well. So would jump on a call with me and just basically say, look, I'm scared. I'm afraid and I'm in pain. So for a year, I gave up that time for writing um, to spend with my sister and to That's help beautiful. her mm. 
mm-hmm. and to and to encourage her as well to to talk to her husband and be open with her kids about this because yes. they, need, yeah. they need to be strong as well because yeah. you know you're trying to get through this now unfortunately she, right. she lost the battle with cancer and she passed away i'm so but, sorry but fortunately i got to say my goodbye to her not in person um she yeah. said to me come fly over and i said no i'm not going to because she had deteriorated and i said you've always she was my older sister she was my only natural sister and i said to her look um, you've always been the rock for me. You've always been this pillar of strength you know, uh-huh. especially growing up. So I don't want to change that opinion. I don't want to see you uh-huh. as weak. I want to talk to you on the phone. So, uh-huh. so I talked to her and, and we said our goodbyes and I said to her, cause she only had like, you know, 24 hours left to live and right. said our goodbyes and that. And then she said to me before she passed, she goes, Oh, oh one more thing. I said, what? And she goes, you know, that book, and I said, book. And she goes, the book you're writing. I mean, yeah. And she goes, the one that you sacrificed all that time for me. I went, yeah. And she goes, if you don't finish that bloody book, I am going to haunt you. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> part of me was going, hey, that would be kind of cool to be haunted by my sister because she's awesome. Um, but it really did shift another mindset in me, which is actually now, now this is important. And now it made me realize how important the story was within there and, and the journey of going through writing as well. Yeah. So so I really yeah. did finish the book to honor my sister. And Oh, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. it's. Um, I've always found that, you know, so, something as huge as that yeah. really changes um, your, not your insight, but your outlook. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, it's yeah. not so much I have to finish this book because I'm going to be famous or I'm going to make lots yeah. of money. It changes it to the fact that you're honouring yourself and you're yeah. honouring your sister's wishes. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, I think most senior writers have had some sort of, um, something happen in their lives that have made yeah. them stop and think, why am I doing this? And I, I did it because I'm the only one left in my family. I'm totally oh, the yeah. only one left. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, um, well, who, who gives a damn? <laughs> my I love the do. little self-censoring there, kids. I could tell what yeah. you really wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, Vince, we've, we've gotten down to the questions of, You've won numerous awards. Hmm. Yep. Which one made your blood run the quickest? <laughs> okay, that was, oh, that's easy for me because I I did not deal with this very well. Um, so the awards are always cool. And, you know, and I like it because it's recognition of hard work and it's recognition of creativity. And it's also, it's, you know, like everyone likes to get a pat on the back. It's awesome. But uh, I got a call one day from Adobe um, or an offshoot at Adobe called Makido. And they were like, hey, we want you to come and speak at this conference. I said, yeah, yeah, sure. Send me through the details. I was literally about to go on stage in Sydney at a conference. I said, send me through the details. And they're like, yep. So I go off the stage, sat down in the front row. I look and I was like, oh, there's an email from them. Oh, the silly goose. They've sent me the wrong one. So I emailed them back and said, oh, you sent me for one in San Francisco. And they went, yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to fly you over there. We're going to pay you business class and we'll put you in a five-star hotel. And we want you to be a keynote at this conference, but you have to come. And I replied and said, well, yes and no. As in, yes, I'm definitely going to come. No, I'm not going to allow you to pay for all that because um, we use Adobe products at my business. And I, I just, I'm always fearful of conflict of interest. So I said, I will yes. pay my own way. Um, I'll come over there. And then Cigna found out about it and went, no, nah, Vince, this is a massive opportunity. We'll pay for you. And I was like, yes, back to business class. Um, so, <laughs> but I went over to this conference and they were really adamant. They said, yeah, but you've got to come. And I said, yeah, yeah, okay, calm down. So we got to this conference and, and it was amazing. Such incredible atmosphere. There's 7,000 people there. And they announced at the beginning, it was like, this is our conference and here's our 25 keynotes. Uh, and we also, they had 25 keynotes and they had a bunch of celebrity keynotes. So Jamie Foxx was there. They had some Olympic athletes. They had Flo uh-huh. Rider, uh, a few yeah. others. But then they announced that actually the, the surprise was they're also announcing the, the first half of the Fearless 50, which is basically the top 50 yes. marketers in the world. Right. And they've chosen the top 25. And then they said, and here are the top 25, your keynotes. And I'm like, whoa, that's so lucky. Wait, I'm in the top 25 uh, keynotes. And then I realized I'm actually one of these people. And I'm looking on the stage. I'm looking at all the people I look up to in the industry. I knew every single other person in that grouping. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, these are my heroes. Yeah. And then there's me. So yes. it was, and then to make it worse, by the way, the, um, the CEO uh, you know, for the conference that was coming out saying, oh, and by the way, we really want to highlight three of those. One of them's all the way from New Zealand. And I'm going, what? My brain just disengaged. So he was looking up at a giant yes. photo of me going, man, that guy looks like me. And I'm like, he's from New Zealand as well. And then my name came up 
And I'm going, wait, he's got the same name as me. Like <laughs> my brain just went on holiday and said, I'm sorry, man, I can't deal with this. But it really was imposter syndrome on steroids. I'm standing there going, this is, I, I was waiting for them to go, oh, wait, sorry, man. We, we met the other Vince Warnock, some guy in Germany. We made a mistake. Yeah. 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 But um, so the award itself meant a lot, but it also caused me to really struggle with imposter syndrome. And to make yes. it worse, we had uh, one of the, one of the sessions there was from this um, professor. She's uh, studied psychology. She was doing research papers on imposter syndrome. So I'm like, hello, I'm definitely going to see, to see her session. And I'm there yes. and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write a book on this one day. So every stat she was giving me, I was writing them down. I'm like, this is gold. I've got to get her book. I've got to get her research. This is going to be awesome. And then she said, and here's how we sabotage ourselves. And I went, <gasps> hang on, what? And she listed all these ways. And it was like, seriously, a checkbox of my life. And oh, I just looked at yeah. this and it was like, ouch, ouch, ouch. So I, I left that session and I really wanted to go to the next session, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I just, I need to go somewhere. So I left the conference, went to a Starbucks, felt really sorry for the poor girl that worked at <laughs> Starbucks. I just went and sat in the corner and I had this piece of paper and a pen. And I'm writing down all the ways I've sabotaged my career and my life and all this. And she came over to me and she goes, um, are you okay? And I'm there, tears streaming down my face going, oh. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm just re-evaluating my life. <laughs> like, and she's oh, like, dear. okay, crazy man alert. Um, so, <laughs> but it really, it really did cause me to kind of stop and reassess myself and actually look yes. and go, you know what, I'm here for a reason. The reason I was recognized wasn't because of my good looks and charm, which obviously that should have been up there because of that. Um, but no, oh, definitely. It was, I agree. Of course, yeah. But no, it was because <laughs> of the challenge I had to the industry about doing better. And one of the things I try and teach the marketing industry is, look, we have a duty of care, not just for data and privacy. We all know that. But we have a duty of care for our clients and our, and our audience to make sure that our messaging isn't misleading or manipulating them, right? We should never drive someone to an outcome that they wouldn't have come to themselves. So right. that challenge in itself was getting recognized. And I had to actually realize that that impacts people and that helps people. And it really did make me stop and reassess myself and go, you know what? I've got to stop hiding. I've got to stop, uh, you know, like doubting myself and, and standing behind imposter syndrome and going, I'm not good enough. If I really want to impact this world, which I do, I need to put myself out there. I need to yes. get in front of people and say, you know what? I've got solutions that are going to help you succeed. I can help, you know, I help people become authors. I help them launch podcasts, help them get on stages. I help them get seen, help them get profitable. But if I don't do that, if I hide behind this imposter syndrome and fear, then I'm denying them the potential to have breakthrough. And that's not fair. So it really oh. did cause me to shift a whole pile of stuff in my mindset. Yeah, I think it's um, it's amazing what actually happens to change your mindset. Yeah. I recently had one of my books uh, made into a short movie. Um, oh, fantastic. And, you didn't tell yeah, me that. No. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it, premier, it premieres this, uh, tomorrow night. It premieres. But, yeah, it's like, oh, my, my goodness. How yeah. did that happen? But I realized, you know, on the quiet moments I do have these days, uh, yeah. now all the grandkids have left, yeah, um, yeah. I realized that I did it. Yeah, you did. I love yeah. that. Yeah. yeah I did. So cool. I'm, so, I'm, I'm just buzzing for you. I'm, I'm celebrating. That's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, yeah. It's, um, and I think that's what, you know, I, I've read the bio of some of your books to do my homework mm. on interviewing you. I, I, the whole signature of both books was you can do this. Yeah. This is entirely up to you. I will hold your hand. Yeah. But I, but I do like the way you wrote about the, the imposter syndrome, what it can do to you. Yeah. you know, I really did enjoy that because it's so true. I think mm -hmm. every single person in the world carries that gene with them. A hundred percent. And this was the big, so if I go back, we'll cycle all the way back to age 11 again. Um, this was a really pivotal moment for me. So growing up in an abusive household, right? I wanted mm -hmm. to hide my entire childhood because yeah. anytime you put your hand up or your head up or you stood out from everyone else, you were a target. And you That's became right. the thing that took the, the, yeah. the beating, you know? Yes. Um, so, so I understand me, it completely. Yeah. Yeah. So I lived in fear mm -hmm. at home. School was a happy place, though. School was a place where uh, I could just kind of let my guard down a little bit and, you know, mm. be free. But age 11, I was, like, I was in this class. I actually found a school bully at that point as well. So I'm going, great. I've got a bully at home and a bully at school. This is not fair. But mm -hmm. I had this inspirational teacher. And I was a, I was a bit of a smart ass as a kid because I was very bright. 
uh, oh. in a low, in a kind of very poverty stricken kind of area and things. And, but I didn't see any future for myself. And I remember oh. we were doing these projects and we had to do these like little papers on a topic that we really like. I chose sharks because, you know, all the boys chose sharks and spiders yeah. and things, dinosaurs, and the girls had yeah. horses and all this. It was, yeah. it was Unicorns adorable. And it was a, fairies. <laughs> exactly. A different time back yeah. then. Um, but That's I was doing this project on sharks and then the teacher said, hey, don't forget, you're going to have to do a oral presentation. So you're going to have to get up in front of the class. And I was like, why? And he goes, it's going to prepare you for the future events when you have to speak on stages and all this kind of stuff. And I went, when are we ever going to get the chance to do that? I mean, come on. So I was this 11-year-old cheeky kid and my teacher just went, well, how about now? And he called me up in front of the class and he said, here's what we're doing, Vince. Yeah, okay, class, listen up. Vince is going to speak for five minutes on a topic. Class, wow. what's the topic he's going to speak on? And, you know, being the creative geniuses they are as a, at age 11, they said, an egg. Yeah. So I had to speak on an <laughs> egg for five minutes. Now, he did this to kind of to kind of jolt me a bit and to make me realize that actually I should pay attention to him probably and try, stop being a smart ass in his class is probably more aligned with it. But what happened was he goes, right, you got 20 seconds to prepare. And then he goes, right, your time starts now. And at the moment he said that, the only thing in my head was that stupid saying, what came first, the chicken or the egg? So I said that out loud. As yeah. soon as I did that, my brain went into this other realm. I don't even know how to describe it, but these words just flowed. And uh -huh. I found I could pull a thread to make everyone laugh. I could pull a thread to make everyone go, <gasps> or, or make them well yes. up a bit inside. And I was like, yes. what's happening? And I just kept going and going until he said, you've got 20 seconds left. And I was like, blah, blah, blah. And I said, so obviously the chicken came first. I don't remember anything else in the speech. That's all I remember. <laughs> everyone, <laughs> but everyone cheered. And I was like, whoa, it was kind of a rush of a feeling. Yes. But I remember turning around to my teacher and he looked at me and he said, Vince, that was fantastic. And I said, thank you. And he goes, no, that was really good. He goes, you have a gift. Do you realize you could do something really significant with your life? Um, and the moment he said that, I felt this yes. weird, weird feeling. I was like, yeah. what is this? And it was hope. It was yes. a belief. In oh, myself. that's beautiful. Yeah. And I, I, and what he gave me there was so powerful and mm. so personal. And I went, at that point, two things happened. One, I wanted to change the narrative of my life. I was like, that's yeah. it. I am going to be something. Like he said, yeah. I've got the opportunity to do this. I'm going to do this. But the other thing it did, Kez, was it made me realize that I want everyone else to feel that feeling. To I feel that, that sense of hope mm -hmm. and of a future mm -hmm. and of the fact that you can create something special. So, yes, that comes through in everything I do. I want to emulate what that teacher did for me. I want people to know that you can do oh, this. That's nice. That's nice, Vince. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I had the, or, almost the same situation with one of my teachers, but when I was in my teens. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the thing that changed my outlook on life was um, – when I was a when I was a tiny child, I won a little gold star for story writing, and oh. that star has stayed in my mind, stayed in my I mind see. forever. I've actually got it all over my office. I have these gold <laughs> stars on my office just to remind me <laughs> of that feeling I felt when I was yep. a child, and why not bring it back into your life? Oh my goodness! So the I, other I was, question, yep. Sorry, the other question I have for you is: you wrote about the, um, a specific tool in changing the mindset. But that's oh. all you really wrote about was, and it made me think to myself, I've got to ask what this tool is. Yep. This tool is um, what I call an impact list. So one of the things when dealing with imposter syndrome. Could you say syndrome, that again? Sorry, Vince. Impact list. Impact list. list. Yep. Okay. Impact. Um, so one of the things I realized is dealing with imposter syndrome, dealing with self-doubt, dealing with fear, dealing with all these kind of things is often that the reality is not matching what's going on in your head. And I see this all the time. My wife's a great example of this. She's one of the most talented counselors I've ever seen. She does a lot of work. Her job is so hard. She does a lot of work with um, teenagers, with young children, and that helping them through grief, helping them through traumatic episodes and traumatic things that happen to them. It's a pandemic, uh, is, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. It is a huge mm. pandemic. Honestly, don't get her started on that. <laughs> it would take five <laughs> hours for her to stop. But it, she does such an important work, but she constantly doubts herself going, I don't know that because it's such an important role. She goes, I don't know mm -hmm. that I have what it takes. And I'm going, the evidence is completely different from the words coming out of your mouth. So I came up with this concept. I actually stole this from um, the cookie jar method that David Goggins came up with. Um, so his was just putting cookie jars and uh, cookies in a jar kind of thing. But I thought, let's shift this a bit. Let's change this, the focus of this. And let's write an impact list, which is where you write down every single person you impact in your job, in your life. And you know, it could be with your books you're writing and things like that. If you don't know the name of them, 
just write right. down anonymous or whatever. Write down yeah. every review where people have said that they were really impacted by your books or really impacted right. by the work that you do. Uh, for me, mm-hmm. I started writing down just taking, I took the um, rubbish out for my neighbor because it was pouring down with rain. I knew he had a bad hip. And I thought, actually, if he goes out there, he's going to slip and that's going to cause some damage. I'll just take it down. So I took it down without even thinking about it and then found out afterwards that it had a huge impact on. Or it's the person oh, you pull over and change the tire yeah. with them, you know, when they're, they're yes. broken down. So yeah. write a list of all these. And what you got to do, you write down the name if you've got it, write down the challenge that they had uh-huh. and what you did to help them and then the outcome. Okay. Right? So nice and simple. And you create this list. And you just keep adding to this list consistently and keep adding to it every time you get feedback. And the reason is not because you're vain, not because you want to feel good about that, but the reason is, is it does three things. The first thing it does is on the days where you're really struggling and we mm-hmm. all have those days. I have those days. Yes. You, know, you wake up and you go, you know what? I can't even get out of bed today. It's too hard. Life's too hard. I just want to reset yep. the whole day, go back to bed. On those days, reading that list is really going to help you, right? Uh-huh. Reading that list because it's going to do two things. It's going to help you by understanding that you are having a huge impact on people. It's uh-huh. understanding that if you don't show up, then you're denying people impact, which is really important. In other words, you're making it oh, I like that. You're making mm. it about somebody else. But uh-huh. then the other thing you're going to realize is looking at this, you're going to realize that your belief and what's coming out of your mouth or certain things you're saying are not lining with what the evidence is. So Uh if you're saying, this is too hard, I'm not good enough, I'm not good at my job, or I'm not good as a writer, and you're reading all this thing from people saying, wow, what a fantastic writer, you're so good at your Uh job, etc. It's going to realign your thoughts. And the reason this is is so powerful, Kez, is because if you think about how our eyes work, for example, like you, you, we look at, um, if we're looking inward, so if I'm looking at self-doubt and imposter syndrome, I'm looking at fear, I'm looking at me because it's how I'm uh-huh. feeling. So it's like my eyes, everything is fixated on this little tiny bubble around my life. Yeah. But the moment I shift my perspective and I go, you know what? I'm now going to focus on the people that I'm impacting. I'm going to exactly. focus on all the people. I like that. Place. Well, straight yeah. away, your shift in focus means that everything uh-huh. that's close to you is now in your peripheral vision, which means you're not focused on it at all which means it has mm. a less power over you. Mm. Um, and I saw this with my daughter. She's a great example of this. When she was uh, about 14, I think it was, she was playing netball. And um, and she's a dedicated netball player. And they were playing this team. It's a really good team. But they were a team that were very aggressive and decided because they were they were in you know danger of losing, they were going to play the player, not the ball. So okay. my daughter was there and this girl came up behind and kicked the back of her leg. And my daughter went down on her knee on this concrete and gashed her knee and blood was coming out of her knee and everything. Now she looked down at her knee and just went, hmm. And you could see the thought process. She's going, I've got one minute left of this game. So she was like, okay, went to put weight on it. Couldn't put weight on her leg. Goes, okay. So she hopped and she was there going, right. She intercepted the ball while hopping, passed off to somebody else. They got a goal. And it was like, oh my goodness, this is intense. She's there trying to intercept. They find they won by like one point. It was incredible. Oh, that's amazing. The whistle rather went, the whistle went. And my daughter looked down at her knee. And the moment she looked down at her knee, her focus shifted from the game, from the thing that yeah. she was doing, to yeah. who she is and what she was feeling. And then the tears started flowing and she couldn't walk and everything. And it was, it taught me such a valuable lesson about perspective and around focus. So mm. impactless, impactless is one of the most powerful tools you can ever use. You just have to write, make sure you're diligent and writing it down, adding to mm. it consistently and going back to it, training yourself to go back when you're struggling, mm. training yourself to go back when you're having self-doubt or imposter syndrome. So would you call that impactless? Would you call that appreciating your own skills? Yeah, it's impreci- it, It's not just skills, though. I would go, because when we look at skills, we look at the things that are taught. It's appreciating actually who you are. Because okay. this is the thing that most people miss is I like um, that. You're, you're incredibly unique, every single person, right? And we say oh, this a lot, people go, oh, yeah, fingerprints and all that kind of stuff. But actually go a little bit deeper. Look at the fact that, Every single one of us has had different experiences in our Uh, life. We've had different challenges, different obstacles, different scars, uh, different learnings, different people speaking into our life, different personalities. All this unique mix of all of these things make you incredibly uh, unique. So it's not uh, just your skills that you're representing here. Like going out and, and, you know, taking my neighbor's trash out. That's not skills. That was uh, just me going, you know what? I don't want somebody to be hurt. So uh, it is appreciating who I am rather than what I'm doing, you know? Mm, I agree totally. It's it. You know, we need we need to start practicing. It's not magic. It's no, it's, it, not. But yeah. it, it's simple faith in ourselves. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about oh the magic, the magic. You know, and I'm a great believer in magic does happen. But yeah. it's um yeah, 
that what you're doing is encouraging us, all of us, yep. to recognize. And if it's, if you don't call it a skill, then then recognize your um, your empathy for yeah. other, other things that have gone on in life. That's it. I think it's just very very important. So your book, cultivating a mindset. This is obviously your mission in life. Oh yeah, mindset's everything. It really is. Yeah. Like honestly. Um, I've seen it time and time again. It's the thing that I battle with time and time again, but it's also the thing that helps me to overcome time and time again. You just need to, in fact, one of the key things is, and it's a big chapter in the book in there, is around cultivating curiosity. And I go into there about the link between curiosity and um, intelligence, like IQ, uh, which is mm -hmm. a correlative link, not a causative link. But if you look at this from a correlative perspective, you can actually see that you can increase your curiosity, which you can't increase your, your intelligence. So maybe you can have a flow on effect of it. So I go into that. Mm -hmm. But one of the key reasons I do that is because I want people to, to get back to what they were like as a kid, asking as many questions as possible. And I, I learned mm -hmm. this. Um, so one of the things I learned is to ask as many questions about people as possible, to try and understand yeah. not just what yeah. people are about, but understand why they do the things they do. Mm -hmm. And I had this, I talked about having that bully when I was at age 11. Um, that bully tormented me for two years. He made my wow. life hell. But then when we got to the end of that two years, he went off to a different school because we all went off to what we call high school. It's, it's uh, yeah. oh, sorry, college it's called high school in the US. Um, yeah. But we went off to high school and he went to a different one to me. So I'm like, finally, I'm free. I'm age 13. I'm like, that's it. I'm free of the bully. Yes, my life's going to be amazing again. Um, still had the bully at home, but that was okay. But I decided I was sick of being a victim. I was sick of being the one that everyone used as a punching bag. So I um, threw myself into learning martial arts and boxing. And I wouldn't yeah. say, you know, definitely not Bruce Lee or Jet Lee here, but certainly got to be able to defend myself. And at age 17, so my last year of high school, he got transferred back to our school. And I'm like, oh, oh my dear God. Oh, yeah. I know. I'm like, this is, like, I've seen every 80s movie. This is the moment that the nerd comes out on top or the underdog. <laughs> comes out. I'm like, this is going to be my moment. It's going to be yes. glorious. And he yeah, walked agree. past me and I yelled his name and I yelled a few <laughs> expletives. And he turned around as he always did waddles over, tries to take a swing at me. Ha, ha, ha. Nope. Took another swing at me. I'm like, ah, 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 nah. And he took a few swings at me, and then finally, bam, I laid him out. I'm not a violent person at all, by the way, but yeah. I laid him out, and he was laying on the right. ground, and I looked down, and I was thinking, wait, I don't feel good. I thought That's I was right. going to feel amazing. I didn't feel good at all. And then mm. next thing you know, I'm in the principal's office because that's what happens when you fight at yeah, school. That's right. And, um, and the principal pulled me aside and he did something that stunned me. He said, look, Vince, he said, do you know why he transferred to our school? And I went, I don't care. You know, I'm a staunch 17-year-old. I'm trying not to yeah. care. I went, I don't care. And he goes, well, you should care. He said, because, and he told me the story. He said, his father abused him and his sister and his mother every day since he was a toddler. Yeah. Right? Every day, to the point where the father abused the mother so badly in front of the two children that she mm -hmm. lost her life. He effectively oh, murdered her. Terrible. In front of the yeah, it's awful. Yeah, it was incredibly terrible. Now, rightfully so, the father went to jail, right, and went mm -hmm. to serve time there. But the two kids went and lived with an auntie and uncle, and they happened to be near our school, and that's why they're here. And I went, well, I didn't know that. And he goes, no, and I wouldn't expect you to know that, Vince. He said, but of all the people that might have understood what he's going through and all the people that could potentially have been there for him, I would have thought what well, that would be you. Mm -hmm. And that made me realize two things. One, I'm not the hero of this story, right? I was the villain in this story. I was the one that had the opportunity to do something outside of the normal patterns he always saw in life. Yes. Actually do something to be there for mm -hmm. rather than just be a thug and hit him like I did. Yeah. But it also taught me that I have no idea what's going on in people's lives. That's right. I can't judge their behavior because I haven't walked in their shoes. So if we can teach curiosity to people, if we can teach people to try and deeply understand each other, we won't just be better as entrepreneurs and authors. We're actually going to be better human beings. Yes. We're going to be able to tolerate each other and have conversations and just I love change that. the world. It's yeah. going to be awesome. Also, it taught me, by the way, that 80s movies lied to us. Don't believe 80s movies. <laughs> They're throwing it out there. Unless it's Star Wars, because you know, technically two of those came out yeah. in the 80s. Just It's, yeah. it's all a lie. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I really uh, firmly believe that that um, kindness and communication is the only way to go. Yeah, you know, um, I think we've all experienced bullies, yep, yep. especially successful people, because we've had to climb out that box that they try and yep. put us in. And yeah, uh, and you've done it. You've done a magic job. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much, Kiz. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, I think we're almost 
we've got about five minutes left of our interview. So would you like to tell the listeners um, your contact details? They will be on the on the script below, oh, below yeah. but let's hear it from you. Well, I make it really hard for people to find me. No, I'm kidding. I make it really easy. You just need to go to chasingtheinsights.com. That is my website. It's the home of my podcast. Um, it is also the home of my books. Um, but it's also where you're going to see a couple of, oh, actually, it's also the home of all of my social media links. So unless you're a spammer, please just connect with me on every social platform. I love meeting new people. It's awesome. But there's also two I'll links on there. I'll definitely be connecting are, with you. Oh, yes. I look forward to it, yes. Um, yeah. But there's also two links on there that are important. One of them is uh, booking a free strategy call. If you're an entrepreneur and you're struggling with anything marketing-wise, hey, I'm here. I'm a resource. Use me. So book a free half-hour yeah, session with me. I'll give you clarity. Um, but it's also the home of um, part of my collaboration book special. So have a look in there. There's a section or there's a menu item that says become an author. If that's something that's of interest to you, go and check it out. We've always got titles there. They sell out really fast. So if you want to collaborate on a book, um, go mm-hmm. check that out and sign up for that as soon as you can. That's fabulous, Vince. And it's not so much a guarantee that I can tell by the way you were saying it. <clears throat> Excuse me, that you're very genuine. You're very yeah. genuine that you will help people and you will help them become the authors that they they see themselves as. But not so much um, an author, but an entrepreneur. Yeah, I appreciate that, Kiz. That is something that's really important to me. Um, I do call out fake entrepreneurs. You get those every now and then. You get the coaches that go, I'm going to make you a millionaire. You're like, you're not yeah. even a millionaire yourself. Come on. <laughs> yeah, like, but, um, yeah. but I won't do anything. I, I honestly, I'm a firm believer in, in what I call karmic marketing which means do good for other people and good things happen to you. And I've seen it time and time again in my life, so much so that I can't deny it, you know, but yeah. also it means that you've got to make sure that you are doing the best for other people. So if exactly. I can't help someone, I'll be open and honest with them. If, if something, in fact, I launched one of my group programs one time, the first 10 people that signed up, I had to contact them and say, no, this is not for you. <laughs> it's not um, the right program. I don't mm-hmm. want you spending your money on this just so you can learn one element of something that's a, a tiny part of a huge program. So yeah. instead I found another offering for them. Yeah. Yeah. So we we have, I've just been we sent a message, we have three minutes left. So <laughs> 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 no, look, I thoroughly enjoyed today and I will definitely be catching up with you. I'll be sending you an email. Um, I would love, I do private reviews of books. So if you want to forward me a book, by all means, um, I'm quite happy to do that for you as well, although you don't really need it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> yeah. we are actually uh, nearly at the end of our time, Vince. So thank you so much for coming on and chatting to me. Thank Tony, you so much for having we'll, me, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, it's been an absolute pleasure. And knowing that you are, um, well, you're from where I am. <laughs> lovely. we were practically I neighbors i still stand with that that's crazy <laughs> yeah. yeah we were actually when you think how small that new zealand is oh yeah and how, yeah as well yeah. especially nine nine and yeah definitely small <laughs> yeah. yeah it's very yeah. small so i haven't been back for many years but i imagine yeah. it's growing so thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and uh your details will be on the link all your links will be below And yeah, I just hope that um, many, many people realize the value that you are offering them. Oh, thank you so much, Kiz. It's been an absolute pleasure. And yeah, and a pleasure getting to kind of know all of you watching or listening to this. So I feel like I know all of you, even though I can't see you physically. (laughs) Oh, there'll be many people listening. There'll be many people. I just, I just, yeah, my wish for everybody is to realize their, um, their brightness their shininess within them Love and that. just, yeah, just show it to the world because we all have it. And it actually goes with your book, you know, yeah. the little light bulb thing you've got on the cover of your book. I just loved it. So <laughs> congratulations on all your wins. Thank you very much. Yep. And yeah. thank you for having me. Cheers. Oh, you're, you're more than welcome. And I think we have, we've run out of time. I think we have, we've got a, a minute to go. I know Tony will be absolutely gutted. She couldn't get to speak to you, but I've had, a fabulous time interviewing you. Thank you so much. And Thank I you. will talk to you um, very, very soon. Cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm so 
grateful that you've come on the show today to tell us about this process because we must tell these stories. We 